On today's video, we're gonna talk about my biggest mistakes and how they helped me to grow as an instructional designer. Let's get started. Hello, my learning nerds, and welcome on in to the nerdiest video that you're going to see today. I wanna to let you in on a bit of a secret in that I almost quit on instructional design altogether. Now, I find this kind of funny because I have a book, a blog, a podcast, a YouTube channel all about instructional design because I really do love what it is that I do. But at the beginning of my instructional design journey, I made so many mistakes. So, 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 so many mistakes. And I wasn't really sure. I was like, is this right for me? Because I'm not getting it. And I just felt really bad. And I was trying to find instructional design mistakes online years ago, and I really didn't see too much out there. So of course, it made me think of like, oh, it's, it's just got to be me. So I don't want that to happen to you. If you see a lot of us in instructional design land right now and doing these awesome, really cool things. Well, I just want to be transparent and let you know that we're also human. And as human beings, we make mistakes and I have made plenty of them. So this video is to highlight all of my fabulous blunders. So hopefully you can learn from my mistakes and don't do the same things that I actually did. So in no particular order, here are my top mistakes. Mistake number one is not showing the value of instructional design. When I first started off, I was told to introduce myself as the learning expert. Now, this does make sense for a lot of people in instructional design land, but it did not work for me. And let me tell you why. It was because all of my subject matter experts who I worked with, they were professors and they were faculty members. I've always worked in higher education. So imagine a 20 something year old starting off a brand new project, working with a seasoned professor who has been teaching for like 30, 40, 50 years. And all of a sudden this kid is just like, oh, I'm on this project because I'm a learning expert. And yeah, they kind of like looked at me and they're like, yeah, uh, me too. So what is it that you exactly do again? And I was like, oh, yeah, uh, that's not the best way of introducing myself. I was like, how do I get around this hurdle when talking about instructional design? Now, for me, what I found that actually worked really well was that I was trying to think of what unique skills could I bring to the table that these people don't have. And for being in a higher education setting, a lot of these professors and these faculty members, they have never made a effective online learning experience before. So when I started to introduce myself on projects, I actually talked about how I know how people learn online. And then I can partner with you to take what I know about learning sciences and learning techniques and put it together with the subject matter experience and expertise that's inside of your head. And then that way we can then make a meaningful learning experience together that's gonna be clear and transparent for our students to see and to see their growth. And when I started to introduce myself like that, they're like, oh, okay. Like he's like the online learning expert guy. And I'm like, yeah, that's why I'm here. And, and other things, but at least it was a start and it stopped to help me feel defeated and crushed. And instead of kind of being looked down upon from these very seasoned faculty members, I started to have more of an equal say and an equal voice in this type of partnership. So I had a seat at the table finally. So when I wanted to be able to make a suggestion or a recommendation, it was not met with so much resistance. Unlike before where I'm like, oh, I'm the learning expert. And they're like, yeah, yeah, good try, kid. Just, just come back again later. So that is definitely by far my first mistake. Mistake number two was not providing feedback. As you can tell from most of those stories I mentioned about before, I was met with a lot of resistance. They kind of crushed me at first and eventually... I stopped providing feedback because I'm like, well, you're the expert in teaching and learning as well, so you must be all set and I'll just kind of be here if you need me, was the attitude that I took early on. And then finally, I had a subject matter expert one time and we were filming for his new course and as we were going into the studio, we already had everything outlined and talked about all of the bullet points that he wanted to mention, what he wanted to do, where he wanted to go, what was the vision for everything with the uh, the course and the recording and whatnot. 
So then we go into the multimedia studio and we start to record. And I notice that he has complete and total stage fright, if you will, as soon as you start to see the red light on the camera. He froze up. He began fumbling his words. He began to kind of not really be himself. And it was actually really weird that the person who I knew talking with him face to face was not at all the same person that was coming across on the camera. And I felt really bad about that because, of course, the students weren't going to get the same experience that they would have if they had him in a face to face classroom because he was just so nervous of everything. And unfortunately for me, after every single video, he turned to me and said, hey, Luke, how was that? And I was like, oh, you're, you're doing good, doing great. Keep on going. And after the third or fourth video, he once again looked at me and he was just like, so how was that? And I did my traditional thumbs up. I was like, oh, it was good. He's like, Luke, that wasn't good. And I was like, well, oh, no, what, what, what do you mean? He's just like, I, I could do way better. He's like, if you think that's good, he's like, I have so much more potential. I could do so much better. And then that's when I started to open up because I saw an opportunity to fix my mistake and say, well, yeah, actually, you know, in this video, you completely missed on this point that you said beforehand that you really wanted to hit home and you fumbled over this word. You meant to say this word and instead this other word came out and all these different suggestions started to come out of my mouth. And before I know it, I was talking for five minutes about what I would do differently. I was like, uh oh, I uh, hope that wasn't too much information. Then he looked at me and he was just like, finally, that is what I've been wanting you to do this entire time. If I'm doing something right, then please tell me so I can do it more. If I'm doing something wrong, then also please correct me so I can improve during the next time around. And I will say thank God for this professor because he was who I needed at that moment of time to really be able to build up my self-esteem and my momentum and to keep on going. And after that, we had a fabulous working relationship where we basically basically did a, a gentleman's agreement to always make sure that we are telling the truth, that we are being straight shooters, and that we aren't going to fluff anything. If we can do something better, we can do it better. And that goes, obviously, not just for the recordings, but, of course, how we actually design the learning experience as well, and everything else that came along with it, too. And that was something that still really did serve me, even to this day, is that now I am not afraid <laughs> to give feedback, and I will absolutely voice my opinion if I see an area for us to be able to grow together as a team. My next mistake was overthinking literally everything. When I say overthink literally everything, I mean it. I constantly was overthinking early on when I became an instructional designer and so much so that I would literally fret over every single word choice that I made on a rubric. And I still remember this, that I actually had a conversation one day with my supervisor and she was asking me why it was taking so long to create a rubric for an assignment. She's like, this really should be taking you only like 30 minutes. Like, what are you doing? And I really had this weird type of mind battle about trying to choose between two different words of identify and define. And I constantly went back and forth on them with the rubric of trying to figure out what is the most appropriate word to use that's going to match up for exactly how folks are actually being assessed when it came to the assignment itself. And this is how my brain actually worked, is that if I was going to be able to pick and choose the word identify and actually mean to choose the word define, well, then what's going to happen is that students are actually going to be upset with everything. They're going to be so upset that they're going to fail. By failing, they're going to talk to their professor and their professor is then going to come back to my department and say, what did you do? Luke messed up this rubric. He needs to be fired and let go of, and all of a sudden I'm going to be out of a job. Yeah. So that is how my brain worked when I first became a designer and uh, not so much anymore. I realized after talking with my supervisor, she was just like, no one is going to make this much of a big deal out of it as just you and I. Uh, yes, we as instructional designers care. We're trying to choose the right word, but are students really going to call the professor and demand that you get fired for making the wrong rubric? She's like, no. It's like, oh, well, well that's good because uh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they would. I don't have a clue. So luckily, we were able to overcome my overthinking. And afterwards, I realized that there was a time and a place to really dedicate a lot of my mental effort in trying to be able to improve and to create and to design and other times it's okay to let things go and to understand that simply I don't understand. And this is what led me to early on of being able to accept criticism 
and feedback from students. Because I went through all of these different types of experiences, I recognize the fact that I am not the target audience for every single course and program and training workshop and whatever else I'm designing. I am always not going to be the target audience, which is going to mean that I can make my best educated assumption and guess about something, but until I really hear it from the students and from the subject matter experts and from other people who I'm collecting feedback from, I'm really not going to know. And that's what finally led me to being able to create pilot programs and actually crave student and learner feedback. I was like, I want to know if I can make it better Please tell me my feelings aren't going to be hurt because the next time around is this going to get better and better and better. And every single time that I implemented new feedback into the design, it always got better ratings and <laughs> rankings for every single time. So finally, my overthinking kind of actually became a superpower by putting it into a much better format for being able to think and to use everything effectively. In the fourth mistake is not believing in the power of I'll figure it out. Four little words that mean so much. As an instructional designer, you will see that the best designers all have the same mentality of, I have no idea how to solve this problem, but I'm going to figure it out. I didn't realize this at first, and I heavily relied on my first supervisor because I just simply didn't know. I didn't have the answers for things. But eventually, I developed this really bad habit of going to her for everything. There should have been plenty of times where if I had just done a quick Google search or go on YouTube or anything else, I would have found the answer. But instead, I immediately went to her as soon as any form of problem or question came about and I didn't have the answer. And then one day she took a two week vacation and all of a sudden I'm like, Oh no, what am I going to do? <laughs> like I don't have my go-to person anymore. And this forced me to actually start to network with other people. It forced me to look into other different types of resources and research papers and books and YouTube and Google and blogs and everything else. And all of a sudden I stopped being so reliant on one person because I realized that I could find the answer and then go and check in with other team members or my team leader, whoever, just to make sure that I was on the right track. But I was able to be able to figure things out a lot more for myself instead of just constantly relying on everybody. And funny enough, what I remember about this too for this moment of time is that back then we used Blackboard for a learning management system for an LMS. And I have a graphic design background, so I was designing the banners for all of the courses. And I made this really awesome banner. It looked fantastic. And I was just like, oh, like this is going to be amazing. The students are going to go into this course and be like, this is a different online course. I can't wait to take this. So here I go. I uploaded my banners. And then what did the banners do? They broke the course. 100% broke everything. Things started to shift left and right. The text didn't make sense anymore. The font was all out of whack. And I was like, oh no, like what? Like no one's around me. No one knows how to fix this. I'm like, oh no, like this, I, I just literally destroyed this course. And sure enough, I was able to go find some tutorials and was able to go back into Photoshop, change the files, put in correct size dimensions and change a whole bunch of other stuff. And then before I know it, put it back into the course and everything looked just fine. So believing in the power of figure it out, don't doubt your abilities. You can do research. You know what to do. You already do it so much. Now we're just doing it more in a professional sense of an instructional design land. But hey, just believe in yourself. Just a little bit more. And then my fifth blunder is assuming. Now I'm just going to simply leave it at that. I made a lot of assumptions when I was starting off as an instructional designer, but it's always still a good reminder, even to this day. And to give you a story about this from my super fun assumptions is that I took over one course from an instructional designer. They gave their two week notice. They pieced out. We had a call though beforehand just to make sure that I was on the same page with everything, that I knew what was going on. What were the deliverables? What were the deadlines? What was the overall final project timeline for everything just so that I was aware? And they informed me that everything should be good to go as long as the SME turns in everything uh, on time because we actually had a bit of a tight deadline at the time, but things were okay, but they could not miss anything or else we're going to be facing some repercussions. 
So I went and I talked with the subject matter expert. We had our first kind of call together. Things seemed fine. I said I would follow back up with them. And then I realized that I didn't hear from them again. I was like, oh no, like what, what, what's happening? And all of a sudden we missed one deadline and then another, and then another. So here I am like, okay, well, I am going to go full fledged. I need to get us back on track. So I'm emailing, I'm texting, I'm calling. I basically did everything besides using like a carrier pigeon and sending a message just to try to finally get this person to respond back to me to say like, what is going on? Like, like, what is there a problem? Like what's currently happening? Are you okay? You know, I had no idea. And then we finally uh, were able to have a, a meeting one day and they started off and they were like, Luke, like what, what is the rush? Like, what's the problem? And I'm looking at them and I was like, uh, no, my, my, my question is literally right. That same back thing to you of what, what is the problem? Like you've missed all of these deadlines. The course is launching in like three months. Like we are, we are not in a good spot here. They looked at me and they're like, three months? No, 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 no. Though it's actually going to be in six months. And potentially we have a bit of wiggle room for another month or so. And I'm like, no. So I take out the project timeline that I was given from the other instructional designer and I showed it to them. I was like, this is my timeline. And they're like, well, that's really weird because I have a different timeline. It's like, no, you don't. Uh, you can't possibly have it. And sure enough, then they're like, nope, this is the date that I was given. It's like, oh, great. So I assumed that we were on the same page from a project management standpoint, that the deadlines were set in stone and that the two parties mutually agreed to uh, abide by these different types of deadlines. And in fact, I was wrong. The designer had one set of deadlines. The SME had a different set of deadlines. I still don't know how this happened. Usually you share the same doc and you just work off of that one. So clearly one person had version one and the other person had version 2.0. And uh, yeah, things weren't on the same page. However, going back to me, I made the assumption that they were on the same page the entire time, which was wrong. When I took over the project, I actually should have started off more like an exploratory kind of phase just to be able to say like, tell me more about how everything has gone so far. What has worked well for you? What perhaps we could improve upon? Is there anything that I should be aware of that can help you a bit more of everything from this type of management standpoint? And I bet I would have gotten so much more uh, helpful information along the way compared to just going into the project and saying like, what are we doing? We're missing all these deadlines when really they weren't technically because they had their own project timeline. So yeah, that was all on me. Well, my friends, that is all I have for you today. I hoped you learned a thing or two and that hopefully you know what to do next time or perhaps what not to do, depending upon what story that I was sharing. If you are a seasoned instructional designer and you are watching this video, go down below in the comments section and actually tell me about something that you perhaps made a mistake on early on and that way other people can learn not to do the same thing as well. If you are new into the instructional design world, first and foremost, welcome along. We have a fantastic learning community, but all also, go ahead and share this video with another friend of yours who's trying to become an instructional designer. I know that there are many, many, many people have questions about this field, and I hope that by being able to share this kind of video, other people are going to make videos as well, just being transparent and talking about the things that we learned along the way and just kind of making fun of ourselves too, because eh, it's all in good fun. I hope you learned a thing or two today. But that's all I have for you folks. Like, comment, subscribe, and all that other typical YouTube stuff. But most importantly, stay nerdy out there. And I'll talk to you next time.